Hello and welcome once again to the Nightlight Podcast. Paul Brecken is with us once again, and by with us, I mean he's actually here with me in my studio, as he also lives in the beautiful country of Uganda. Great to have you back, Paul. Yes, well, first of all, thank you for having me back and being able to share the things that the Lord has really taught me and brought me through. And what I want to share with you is Psalms 23. Okay. Because it's a verse that was given to me back in 1995 when I was at a critical point in my walk with the Lord. You know, I'd spent 20, 22 years doing ministry, involved deeply in the church as a leader and so forth. And there was a point where it just fell short of my inner self, my soul. My soul was really craving and hungry, almost to the point of being uh, desperate. You know, there's a cry deep within the soul that we're either numb to or unaware of. Right. And we were so outward and so busy in doing the work for Jesus. And so it came to that point where I had to stop and I really cried out to the Lord. And it was one, it's, it's called like a, a lover's prayer because it was for my deep hunger to know him, yes. to love him with everything within me. That was this, this prayer. It was a prayer of longing, a, a prayer to say, Lord, whatever it takes, I want you more than anything. Wow. That was a pivoting point. It was almost as if the Father was waiting for that moment in my life. It didn't mean that I didn't love him. I wasn't, I was serving him. I was, but there's something about this transition where it's like, I am willing no matter what. I need to move on with you, Father. Say, and out of this came this journey. Interesting. And so Psalms 23 is really the journey of a lover. And he gave me this verse. And I remember when, because I, I asked the Lord, Lord, there's things going on in my life. There was trouble. There was, what should I say, painful events. I mean, this is actually the time where my wife, had, uh, at that time, we were married for 17 years. She says, I want to separate. I want to divorce. It creates a crisis. And out of that, you know, uh, this came this, this need to know. In fact, this prayer happened before that. I'm going to say this happened before that, but this came. And so the Father gave me Psalms 23. I had no idea the meaning and the depth of this, but it was something that I actually had journeyed through. And I want to share this because people are in this place. I know that God has been doing a work within the Bride of Christ within the past 10, maybe 20 years. Right. And so this journey is critical because like any journey, you have to ask, well, where is it taking me? Right. Where's the end of this journey that Jesus wants to take me on? Well, it's coming home. It's the journey of the lover to come into the presence of the Father, the abiding place, heaven within us. Wow. So it's an inward journey that the lovers must take, and it's a call. It's something that you must um, be willing. It's an invitation. God will never force you. He will never like insist that you must do this. It's always an invitation, and he will come to you with that. And so it's for the lovers, because nobody would be willing to take this kind of a journey unless it's based in love and love alone. That's right. In fact, there's some verses I need to kind of set up the context of this journey of what Jesus was saying to his disciples. And in John chapter 14, you remember this is the, the last days. This is the moment, you know, where he was going to face Calvary. Yes. And so he's in the upper room sharing from 14 to 17, these chapters, which I would encourage people to read because they're powerful words about the lover. And so he's sharing with his disciples. And if you would read. John fourteen twenty one. Yeah. It says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. So he's talking about this. Like there's a, there's a commitment. He says, those who love me, will keep my commandments. In other words, the words that I speak, you're willing 
to follow. You're willing to give it all. See, if you think about it, if he says, if you liked me, you keep. No, he says, love me, because there's something about love that's intoxicating. It's insane. That's right. <laughs> when you fall in love with someone, you will do anything to be with them, to be part of their life. Yes. Okay? And the gospel, the good news, is about this love. We were created to be lovers of God. That's the intent. It's the meaning of our existence. Yes. Okay. And that was lost. There's a separation that occurred. And this is the death that came to us. That's right. And so Jesus sets us up. He says, look, if you love me, then my Father will love you. We respond to the lover's heart. And he will manifest himself to us. He will reveal himself. And then he, he emphasizes this again. So if you can read the next verse in actually 23. This is from the New International Version. Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. So he adds something about home. And this is the thing that I, I didn't understand. I had spent 20-some years, right, doing the work of a father, you know, for his sake, right? We're, you know, ministering and giving and giving. And yet I realize I'm not home. I feel like an orphan still. I love him right, to the degree that I understood that. But I didn't feel this. I felt like an orphan. Still felt like, where is God still? Yes. You know, I pray to him. I see him moving through me. But the sense of the soul itself as coming home, that's what was desperate. There was this longing in me that wasn't satisfied because I wasn't in the intimate union with the Father. Right. And so this is the calling and this is what he's bringing us into. And he says, it'll make my home with him in us. And actually, before this, he makes this other grand statement that I'd like you to read in John 14, verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is no one that I know in human history who's made such a claim. That's right. No other prophets of any other religions of origin who make such a bold, dramatic claim as this. And he says, I, I alone am the only way. There is no other way. And not only that, but he says, I am the truth. This truth is the reality and so when we find ourselves lost and in darkness, it's like a light. He uses this a lot, a light that exposes the darkness. And Jesus, this gets to the Psalms 20, Jesus is the shepherd. Jesus is the one that must show us the way, expose the truth so we can see, so that he can bring us to life. Because he says, I am the life. He is the giver of life. And this is up against this idea. Like he says, no one can come to the Father except through me. Yes. Wow. That's what I'm saying. He then is the one we must be willing to let him lead us on this journey. And this is what the Psalms 23 leads us to. But I want to say one more thing about this idea of a lover. And this is in Luke 14. Verse 26 through 27, if you could read that. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Paul, I know a lot of people have difficulty with the first part of that verse. Yeah, you don't hear too many sermons on this verse because it's a strong word, hate. But basically what he's saying is, is if your love for your mother or your father is greater than the love for me, then you can't be my disciple. In other words, you won't be willing to take this journey. That's right. Even your own life. You must not love your life 
before the love that I because Jesus is the giver of life. He's the giver of love. He is the essence of what we are searching for. We just don't know that. And we've taken our love into the world and into relationships. These are what I call the other lovers that we've given our heart to, and they've disappointed us. They've discouraged us. They've wounded us. And this is where we find ourselves in this state. And so Jesus must come right, as the only way to show us our salvation, to show us how to be set free, to come home into the presence and the love of the Father, because that's where it all ends and begins. Inspiring you to love and serve Jesus more. You're listening to Night Light. So let's start with this journey in Psalms 23. And I would love for you to read the whole Psalms, and then we'll take it apart from there. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you. You could see that this is a, a journey. And so it, let's start with the beginning. The Lord is my shepherd. The lover must come to terms with who is in charge, who is in control. First of all, Jesus is the shepherd, and he proclaims us about himself. And so we have learned in our life, because apart from the Father, we're left alone. Yes. In our loneliness, in our desperation, we try whatever we can to try to make life work whether you're a Christian or not, it's something that we are born into and the world teaches us, right? Gives us all kinds of ways of being in control and how to live a life that can produce sense of joy and happiness and peace. And we talk about wealth and prosperity and, you know, privileges of things that we can earn and, you know, and titles and positions because our identity is wrapped up into who we are and what we do in the world. That's right. And so we are used to being in control. And so he says, okay, the Lord is my shepherd. And I think it's important to read further of what Jesus said about him being the shepherd, because it's important to know where we go from here. So again, I want to read another verse. This is in John 10, 1 through 10. It's a little longer, but the story is important to understand where we go from Psalms 23 for this. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable Jesus spake unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. So this verse is rich. 
There's so much in this. But the idea is, he says, basically, I am the way. I am the door. There's no other door. And the door always represents a transition coming from one place into another. Yes. And so through Christ, those who hear his voice, those who have given their hearts to him, those who are willing to follow him, he will be that access, and he's going to take you on a journey. And the journey is an inward journey within your soul because it's the soul that is in captivity with the enemy. Right. It talks about the enemy came in through another door, another way, right? Right. And he was only there to kill, steal, and destroy. And so we find ourselves in a prison deep within our soul, it's important because we don't often realize we're almost unconscious about this captivity. But Jesus says, look, I have a purpose. And my purpose is to come to lead you back to the Father. And I need to do it in a way that is like legal. <laughs> this, this idea of God has governing principles within the world. And so he must come in a way as the Son of Man on earth— Right? who did not sin. He had this relationship with the Father, and Satan had no hold on him. That's right. And so when he came and he sacrificed himself, the greatest act of love, he gave it all, right? Yes. And so he had the right, what he went through, to be able to take away the grip that Satan has in her soul. He has the keys of death. That's right. And out of that, he has the right to set us free. For those who will believe, for those who are willing to follow, those who are willing, right, to love him, he will come to us. Amen. So out of this, this, this whole dialogue that Jesus is describing to his disciples and getting back to this journey, the lover's journey here in Psalms 23. So we must acknowledge that he's the shepherd, that I'm willing to let go. And then he says, I shall not want. Now this gets back to this idea of surrendering. Want. This is the desire of our self, our soul, to get what we want. I want this. I want that. I need this. I need that. Whatever that might be, you could put that in there, say. Right. And he's saying, okay, I shall not want. I'm relinquishing control to the hands of my beloved, right, good shepherd, the shepherd that really loves us and cares for us. And so that he then becomes your provider of all things. Right. We're used to being in control. We must learn to surrender. So this is how the journey is beginning. And then it moves. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Notice the words, he makes me. There are circumstances that will come in your life where you will have no choice, and they will f force you to, like, surrender. That's right. And this can be in all kinds of shapes and forms. I mean, let's say you're, you're trying to get ahead financially, and you have this looking forward to a promotion at work. You're doing all the hard work, and you're getting recognition, and everything is going great. And then all of a sudden, things change, and the company's losing money, and you're laid off. This wasn't your making, this wasn't your choice, but now you find yourself with no job, not even a promotion, but now you're like, what am I going to do? Right. And then you're like, okay, well, let me, resumes, put them out, go to interviews, and you're going to interview, and nothing's happening. It's like the door is shut, and you're panicking, and you're praying more, you're praying more. Right. And the Lord says, he makes you lie down in green pastures. Green pastures. Wow. This is the bread of life that Jesus gives. He wants to give you. I am the one in control. I am the one, right, that will provide for you. Yes. So you, he, like, forces, I want you to stop and learn to rest in the midst of calamity. How can you rest in that unless you are learning to surrender and trust, this is about trusting our shepherd who's leading us. We're learning these great, valuable lessons. And he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats this bread that I give to you will not be hungry. 
And so the soul must begin to learn to feast, right? To rest in Christ in the time of calamity. And, and this especially today, with what's going on out there, we're going, this stuff is scaring me. It is. That's right. Things are happening. Wickedness and evil seems to be prevailing. And so how can I find rest if my heart was, right, looking for things that gave me security, that gave me peace, right? We have all these things, you know, to give us the sense of comfort. And sec- well, no, it's shaking. It's like coming apart. That's right. It's like Jesus being in the boat in the storm when the, the disciples are like bailing water out of the boat. They're sinking, and he's sleeping in the back of the boat. How does he do that? Right. I mean, that's like— Nobody would do that. You'd be bailing water, you know, panicking. For you know, sure. we're, we're sinking, and he's sleeping. So Jesus found, see, he rested in the Father. All things were provided to him through the Father. Amen. And by the way, this journey is not a straight line. It's not something that you go from A to B to C to D. No, it's more of you circle around. I mean, you will come to this place more than once, the green pastures where you're being, you know, like— he makes you lie down. Not once, twice, maybe a hundred times or more, I'm saying. Right. It, but it's that one piece. And then it, he moves on. So now there's a choice here. Not only does he make you lie down in green pasture, but he leads you beside still waters. Yes. The idea is now you have a choice he offers you. Will you follow me to the place of still waters, which is the water of life? He says... The water that I give you, you should not thirst. So just like the bread of life, Jesus becomes the water of life. Right. But this is a choice now. You know, let's say, <laughs> use this illustration. You, let's say life has been really rough and you're stressed out at work or things going on. And one of the things that you should do is you come home and you have a glass of wine right. to kind of just settle you down. And it works really well. It just kind of relaxes you. So you can just kind of let go of the stress and the problems. And then Jesus comes to you and he says, I have something better for you. Will you put the bottle, right, the glass of wine aside and come and drink from the water that I will give you? There you will find comfort and peace. So the other one was about rest. Now this is about comfort and peace. Wow. But you must choose. Will you hear my words? Remember, if you love me, you will what? Hear my words. You will keep my command because he wants to give us something altogether better, which we are created for. These are the other lovers we've given our hearts to that he's exposing. This is the journey. It's an inward journey that we must, must be, this cleansing, this, this idea of being sanctified, made whole. This is part of that. So you go through all kinds of experiences where you're having to choose or things are coming upon you in your life to expose us, to make you aware. Truth must come to us to see. And so circumstances is what reveals the truth of what's in us. Bringing you peace in the midst of the storm. You're listening to Night Light. And then he goes on, he restores my soul. So that's like the declaration. I am the only one who can restore your soul when you're hungry or when you're thirsty. Not me, not others, not the prophet or the pastor or the apostle. It's like Jesus himself becomes the bread of life and the water of life. Every breath that I take, okay, that sustains me comes from the shepherd and the father. Wow. He will manifest himself to us if we love him. Beautiful. Right? And then he goes on. Now it goes deeper. And you go, okay, now what? Where is he going to lead me to? He says, he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yes. Now this goes even closer and deeper down to things that we cherish more. We need to know between good and evil, the righteousness of God. Again, he leads you. There's a choice that's given, and there's the exposure. These are things that you may not be aware of that you do. Let's say perhaps you tend to exaggerate when you're talking to people. Build yourself up. 
in ways to make you feel like you know, you're important, you're accepted. So you're not really being truthful. You're exaggerating or you're lying or you're deceiving or you're manipulating, especially when things aren't going your way. We have a tendency to try to again, control things. That's right. And you may not be aware. Of it. And so all of a sudden you find yourself in situations where you're being confronted. You're being called out. Things are being exposed. And then he does this. There's a choice of letting go of the things that do not belong in the kingdom of heaven. And there are times where you're struggling to let go of things. And Jesus says, will you do it for my sake? Oh, this goes to the heart of love. Yes. <laughs> if you love him, which you do, you go, I will. Not my will be done, but thy will be done. Amen. For your sake, because you're worth it. If you ask me to do this, I will do this. Yes. And so there's this deepening of love in this place that goes deeper into your soul. So here we are. He's, God, he's, he's, he's leading us, going down. Beautiful. And then there's even the deeper things. Yea, though I walk to the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. This is the journey that we don't want to take. We will do everything possible to avoid this. Very true. It's like, uh, Lord, by the way, a valley, there's no exit. When you go down a valley, you have what, sides of like a cliff and walls. There's only one way out and that's through the valley. And when you go through the valley, you're uh, at risk, Yes. right? For attacks. I mean, there's like, you can be blocked in. It's like a scary thing. You don't want to go through a valley. And this is the valley of the shadow of death. This is where the heart, the grip that Satan has upon us. Because in this is the pain. It's the wounded, the deep wounding of the soul. It's not physical death. It's the, the agony of the soul that's experiencing the separation from the Father. You know, the idea of shadow, Carl Jung, who is a psychiatrist uh, back in the early 1900s, talked about the shadow. The shadow is the things that we don't want to look at. It's, you know, it's the bad, it's the ugly side of ourselves. And he says we must come to terms with the shadow. And so in the sense, this fear of I don't want to see what's down. Jesus must take you down to the basement, the cellar of your soul. Because this is where it all comes from. This is where sin comes from. Sin is just a symptom. It's not the cause. It's the acting out. It's what we've learned to do to try to heal ourselves or numb ourselves or ignore ourselves, right? And all this activity that he's exposing, but he's not gotten to the heart, the very depths of our soul. So he must take us there, and we must be willing to go but he says, don't be afraid. I will not leave you. I'm here with you every step of the way. And I have the authority to keep Satan from attacking you, the rod and thy staff. And so we'll do this together because in this you will find life. It feels like you're going to die, but you will find life. So down you go. Down you go. And this is where, if you're thinking about it in the field of psychology, there's almost 300 diagnoses of what we call um, the diseases of the soul, the psyche. Psyche means soul. And so this is where, <laughs> where all of this pain acts out through mental health issues that is rampant. So it's a way we try to manage all of this. And so we go down to this place. And we see that we're in captivity. And there are four wounds that we suffer from in this place. Shame, fear, self-contempt, and longing. Interesting. And shame, and this is where in the Garden of Eden, this is where it all comes from. It started from the fall when they partook of the forbidden fruit. When death came, God says, the day that you eat, you will die. That's right. What died? The relationship between the Father and Adam and Eve. Right. And out of that came shame. 
And shame is a killer of love. It separates you from connection. Into, and, and this is with anybody. When you're feeling the shame, it's a painful, most devastating emotion where you want to cover yourself. Don't look upon me because I am, I'm bad, I'm ugly, I'm exposed. And so we, we hide. This is the next thing, the fear that comes in. We hide from people. We look away, but we don't want to connect. And we struggle with this in all of our relationships, not just with the Father, but it's expressed in all of this around us. And so the fear is the fear of, of the rejection, the abandonment. You're not good enough, therefore, right? You're not worthy to be in a relationship. Right. And out of that fear comes the self-contempt. You hate yourself for what you have done. There's this like affliction you bring upon yourself. If it's not you, it extends out to others, blaming others, blaming yourself. You know what I'm saying? This almost like this self-destructive anger. Yes. And then out of that is longing and hunger for what we had that we lost. And that is the love of the Father, which is life. It's eternal life. Right. So here we are in this condition. So Jesus brings us down to this place and we see like the truth. He exposes this within us. We don't want to see this this pain, the shame, this, this fear. And this is where Satan has a hold of us. He has the legal right to accuse us. He's the accuser of the brethren. Right. And we hear that and we go, yeah, that's right. I did. I did do the, look, I, I deserve this, right, this punishment. And you know what the antidote is with shame? Forgiveness. Jesus brings forgiveness. Yes. He must bring that to the very core of our souls and our hearts. Because out of forgiveness, we can now let go of the grip of the accuser. This all changes. And so out of this, he sets us free. Wow. He has the keys of death to unlock the prison door, right, that kept us in the sense of like bondage and grip of Satan and sets us free. Now we can go home. We were like orphans lost under the grip of Satan, and now we can come home. So he sets us free, and here we go. Praise God. Out of the depths of hell, you might say, where Jesus went down to and set people free, we now can come up into the place where God's presence welcomed. We're forgiven. We're covered, right? It's like if we're naked and exposed, he gives us the righteousness to cover us of our shame. And then, this is what I'm saying, now things change in Psalms 23. We've gone through this process of transformation. And this is great. He says, I prepare a table before you in the presence of my enemies. <laughs> he turns the table. Right. Satan fed on us on our fear, our shame. He delighted in our suffering because he hates us. We are actually the ones that will defeat him. Wow. We just don't know that. We've been bound. We're, we're like in prison. We're enslaved. Satan had no hold on Jesus because he was totally free from any condemnation, from any legal right to keep him bound. He was totally free. And we are set free. That's right. And so the tables turn. And so God prepares a table, a banquety table, where now we've learned to what? Eat and drink the food that he provides. No longer that Satan has deceived us to give us crumbs, thinking that this is going to save us. So no. This turn. And so Satan is looking upon this. We are set free, eating from the banqueting table of God, rejoicing. We are dancing. We are liberated. We are celebrating. We are experiencing the love of the Father. And then it gets even more. Not only that, but then he anoints my head with oil. Oh, this is profound. The anointing of God has to do with authority, has to do with favor, has to do with giving us, right, this authority to rule and reign in the earth. 
Right. Now this terrifies Satan because now you have been given the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you should bind on earth should be bound in heaven. Whatever you release on earth should be released in heaven. Yes. We now have authority to bring the kingdom of heaven down on earth. He's terrified. He can't stop us. He can't deceive us. He can't trick us. We have been set free, and now we are an enemy to him, a real threat, a serious threat, as Jesus was. We will be as Jesus was with the Father. He's in us. Wow. But not only that, but then it goes on. It's my cup shall overflow. This is the presence of God that fills us up, not just halfway, but brimming and bubbling over. So the glory of God, his presence, will come out of us into the earth. Awesome. And the earth will see God's love, God's glory in the earth where we will be doing signs and wonders and miracles, awesome. bringing the joy, right? The glory here on earth, taking dominion what Satan had taken from us. This is what's going to happen. Wonderful. This is now. This is where the church is coming to this place. We've gone through this journey for the past maybe few years or months, depending on where you're at. There's people listening to me. I don't know where you are in this journey, but the purpose of this is to bring the sons and daughters of God in the earth. That creation is moaning and groaning, waiting for that moment. We will become a people that have never been seen before in human history or thereafter. The bride of Christ manifested. On wow. The world is getting darker, but God has a people he's going to reveal in the earth, anointed, our heads anointed, the banqueting table, the cup that overflows. So not only that, but I think the part that's the favorite for me, he said, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Yes. So the righteousness and the goodness of God, the mercy or love that will follow me every step I take, we take dominion. The kingdom of heaven is seen in the earth. God's presence coming in all over the world. There will be great revivals. People will be coming to the Lord because they will see that he is, right? the way, the truth, and the only one he can give life to, and that's through us. And then I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the presence of God within us, home, coming home, the abiding place, and nobody can take this from you. No power, no principality, no forever. It will never leave you. Your relationship is now one with the Father, union with him the way it was meant to be. That's right. Not only in this life, but the life after, coming home. This is the fullness of salvation. And this is what the, the Psalms is talking about, this journey coming into this place. Inspiring you to dig deeper into God's word. You're listening to Nightlight. Again, for those who are out there, to encourage you, to understand this is not the enemy attacking circumstances in your life. If you're a lover of God and you're following him, he's there to teach you and to show you and to let go of the other lovers and embrace him as the sole true lover of our life. He will then take you down into these things that you're afraid of. They set you free in order to come into the fullness, right? I will manifest myself before you. I will bring you home. So where I am, you can be also. These are the words of Jesus and what he's talking about. Yes. How long that takes, it depends on how fast you want to run, how far you want to go. And I think the younger you are, there's less that you have to undo. That's true. For me, it started at age 40. And there was a lot that had to be undone because of these. I built a house of cards, you know, that had to be taken. And he couldn't do it too fast because it would overwhelm me. He, he will go at the pace where you're willing to walk. He will not leave you. If you stop, he will not leave you. He will not be angry with you. He understands where you're at, and he will lovingly encourage you and bring you in. 
because the goal is to come through and into the presence of the Father. Beautiful thought. And this is another thing. Look at the end. Don't look at the circumstance. It says the hope that lies before you, okay, that can encourage you. And I remember going through these things. I remember, you know what? I don't understand what I'm going through, but I, t I know this. There's the banqueting table. There's the anointing. There's the cup. There's the promise that he will never leave me, the blessings that will follow me. And more than anything, I would dwell in the house of the Lord for him. That's where I'm heading. That's what I want more than anything. And that's what will get you through, to take the step, to go follow Jesus where we need to follow. And thank you, Paul, for that deep and beautiful exposition of one of the best-known and best-loved chapters in the Bible, Psalm 23. And uh, you certainly opened up, for me, new levels of meaning that I'd never thought of before, and I'm sure it's been a blessing to our listeners also. Anything else to add before we close? I think it's if you can just embrace this, it makes sense. It's there, and you are going through these things. Don't stop. There is beauty, there is glory waiting for you at the other end. And there is a work to be done in the earth that would be manifested in this lifetime. It's coming. It is here. God's going to start revealing the lovers of God, and they'll be doing a great work in the earth. And if Paul's teaching was a blessing to you, please do leave a comment for him below. This is Chris Glynn signing out and looking forward to being back with you again soon for another awesome edition of Nightlight. Bye for now.